Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Walter. Hi. How are you doing? I'm fine. Good. Yes. Are we continuing with understanding Pope Francis? That is the plan, because if we understand what all this is about, then maybe we can start making sense of what's happening in the world. Correct. And there's obviously some more to come as well. This yes. won't be the final one. Well, it's a very big topic. Definitely. Because it's bringing together decades, mm -hmm. centuries, millennia of planning. Yes. And it's coming to fruition. So we need to understand what is going on. And today we're going to look at understanding Pope Francis, the Vatican II Pope. And that should supply some answers to the conservative Catholics as well. And hopefully open some eyes. Let's open with May the God help us. Yes. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for giving us the opportunity to have this discussion. We ask that you bless the discussion and also the viewers and enlighten our minds that we can discern what to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, last time we spoke about the source of inspiration. Mm. And we showed that it was from the exercises of Loyola and that it was a contemplative mode of action. Yes. So the source is not scripture, mm. and that's very important. But if you masquerade as a Christian organization, but place these other uh, areas in the forefront, then you can get away with many, many things. And it seems as if it's somehow connected to Christianity, but in actual fact, it's yes. rooted elsewhere. Yes. No, that's the danger of all this. It's sometimes a lot of these things seem at the outside if it's right. Yes. So let's just make sure that we are on the right track here and that Pope Francis indeed is a Vatican II Pope. Mm. So we will go back to that interview with the head of the Jesuit order, the Jesuit general, and then we'll hear what he has to say. Um, sticking with uh, Pope Francis, um, there's a narrative around him and his papacy that he's um, a radical reformer. And among his fans, uh, this can sometimes lead to disappointment if they think he's not changing things um, fast enough or, or far, going far enough. And among his critics who are worried that, um, you know, he might be doing radical changes that, that um, go against the, you know, the church tradition. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, what do you think of that narrative? And is that... Is it the right one? Does it get something wrong about Pope Francis and what he's trying to do um, to the with the church? Well, Pope Francis is without doubt a man of the Second Vatican Council. For sure. You are young people and you don't, maybe you don't remember Vatican Council, but if somebody wants to understand Pope Francis and his way of proceeding and his leadership needs to go back to the experience, to the decrease, and to the development of the church provoked by the Second Vatican Council. That's a, a, a reference point that we cannot uh, forget if we want to understand what is going on in the church and in the, in the mind and the heart of Pope Francis. So Pope Francis is leading the church in the sense of Vatican II, mm -hmm. decided with the adjustments needed by the new times and the signs of the spirit. That's why he is all the time talking about human migration in all its forms, the environment crisis, the growth of inequality, because the Vatican Council uh, teach us to read the signs of times and to respond to them. And we have to respond with dialogue among all, especially different religious, and we have to use the dialogue as the path to fraternity. That's mm. what Pope Francis is trying to do. 
Well, Martin, that was pretty clear. <laughs> we have it right out of the horse's mouth that Pope Francis is a Vatican II Pope. That is essential in order to create this brotherhood mm -hmm. of inclusivity, not separateness. No. And uh, so we have to understand it in that context. Now the question is, is this something new? No, of course not. This has come a long, long way. And uh, Vatican II was in 1962 already. Mm -hmm. So we are dealing with a Vatican II agenda. And we need to understand what that entails. Yes. So let's briefly go back to the history of Vatican II. Vatican II was started under the papacy of Pope John the Twenty Third. He is the Vatican II Pope. And this is what it was about. On twenty five january nineteen fifty nine, only two months after his election as Pope, John the Twenty Third surprised the world by announcing the Council to give the Church the possibility to contribute more efficaciously to the solution of the problems of the modern age. The joyful echo brought about its announcement, as well as the lively interest on the part of non-Catholics and even non-Christians, proved in the most eloquent manner that the historical importance of the event has not escaped anyone. It was what they called a renewal. Mm. But the question is, was it? Not only was it called a renewal, apparently when asked what it was about, he went to the window and opened it and he said, a breath of fresh air. Mm. Now, these are important issues that we need to understand because when it comes to the gathering of all humanity, yes. all systems, whether political or religious, then you need this openness with an agenda. Yes, because a lot of people say Rome has changed. Rome has never changed. It cannot change. John the Twenty Third in Mater e Magistra wrote, By far the most notable evidence of the social teaching and action which the Church has set forth through the centuries undoubtedly is the very distinguished encyclical letter Rerum Novarum. Issued 70 years ago, the norms and recommendation contained therein are so momentous that their memory will never fall into oblivion. So now we're not dealing with a modern pope anymore. We are dealing with a couple of decades yeah. of history, right? Mm -hmm. Because if Vatican II was announced in 1959, that's uh, 60 years ago, Yes, right? 62 years ago. Yeah to be exact. The other thing is, of course, he's referring to Rerum Novarum, which deals with mm. social issues. That goes back another 70 years. So we're dealing with more than a century of preparation here. And this is what people need to understand. Yes. Never does it change. It only expands what is already yeah. there. It actually widens the net to yes. catch more. It widens the net. In Summa Theologicae, Thomas Aquinas wrote, this is one of the papal encyclicals, because the goods of some are due to others by natural law, there is no sin if the poor take the goods of their neighbors. Thomas wrote, in cases of need, all things are common property, so that there would seem to be no sin in taking another's property, for need has made it common. Now, that statement in itself tells us what the social climate must be like. Now, when we think of the riots that occurred in just the last year mm -hmm. and the year before that, and some of the issues in the cities and the Black Lives Matter movement and all of the riots and the looting, yes. and there was no recourse mm. for anyone that was looted. They just have to accept it. 
Well, this is based on this philosophy that the poor have come to the point where they now have the right without sinning to take yeah. because it is common. It, it's actually amazing that it's directly opposing the 10th commandment. Yes, and the commandment thou shalt not steal. Yeah. So there are two commandments there that are being transgressed and this man is a saint. So it seems to me that if you are a transgressor of God's law, uh, you can become a saint in Roman Catholicism. Yeah. What's also noteworthy is that this might seem to people just a, a quote by some unknown person to them. But this is what's being planned and implemented yes. right through the world. I mean, Thomas Aquinas is a very prominent figure in Catholic Church history. And all the papal encyclicals refer to him. The entire idea of natural law is largely based on the ideas of Thomas Aquinas. And we will see in later um, episodes that this is very important. And uh, these are papal quotes where they quote him. Here is another uh, papal encyclical, Gaudium et Spes. These are all Vatican II encyclicals. The Vatican II constitution that John Paul II quoted explained at greater length. If one is in extreme necessity, he has the right to procure for himself what he needs out of the riches of others. Since there are so many people prostrate with hunger in the world, this sacred council urges all, both individuals and governments, to remember the aphorism of the fathers. Feed the man dying of hunger? Because if you have not fed him, you have killed him. So this is where Catholic social teaching mm. comes to the fore. And since the world is so steeped in poverty in many, many areas of the world, this is a very fertile ground mm. to foment unrest yes. in the world. Yes, exactly. And we can see it in our current day. Correct. You now, see this right around. So how do you want to further your agenda? You need masses. Yes. So it is interesting to me that if you go to the Catholic countries in the world, that is where, we, where you find the most poverty. Why do you think they all want to run away from those countries and seek a better life elsewhere, right? Yeah. yeah. That's why we have all the border issues and Correct. all of these things. So these are very interesting things. And Vatican II has a social agenda, mm -hmm. it has a moral agenda, it has a religious agenda, and we need to look at all of them. So now, the first Vatican Council, the Council of Trent, that council was run by the Jesuits as well. Now, the Council of Trent and the first Vatican Council was called into existence because of the crisis of dealing with Protestantism. And Protestantism had clearly expounded the errors of the papacy. And Protestantism claimed sola scriptura. Mm, yes. And Protestantism put it very clearly that Christ was the head of the church and not a human being such as the Pope and that one couldn't have forgiveness of sins through a system you had to go to Christ. So those were the issues. Righteousness by faith was a very important issue. Mm. Uh, papal succession, apostolic succession, was a very important issue because the papacy claimed mm -hmm. that their authority came down an unbroken line from Peter to the present Pope. Yes, and like we've seen... That's not the case in one of our previous ones. Correct. So now we're not going to deal yeah. with the Council of Trent in any way. But the Council of Trent set the groundwork for the separation between Protestantism and Catholicism. And the papal encyclicals and the papal decrees that came out of Vatican I roundly condemned 
Protestantism in all its forms and all its specific doctrines. And those decrees are ex cathedra mm -hmm. from the papal chair. They are infallible. We will show this later on as well. And therefore they can never be changed. Yeah. So Vatican I seems like a anti-Protestant, ultra-conservative, Catholic tradition-based council. That's why you have so many Catholics today who are totally confused by Vatican II because it seems as if there is such a liberal yes. agenda. And how does this liberal agenda gel with this conservative traditional agenda of mm. Vatican I? So the Protestants saying Rome must have changed. Yes. And that's not the case. That is not the case. Now, there's a difference between a pope speaking ex cathedra from the papal chair, because in this council, the First Vatican Council, the pope, as traditionally was still carried on the shoulders into, like the old pagan priests were, yes. into the council. The modern council dispensed with all of that and made him more congenial and more acceptable to humanity. And many of the statements that come out of Vatican II are not necessarily ex cathedra. So they don't contradict, they just seem to mm, contradict. Mm. And that's very important. So let's look at some of these issues because this is important. So the question is, did the Vatican II Council change the Roman Catholic position established at the Council of Trent, which clearly condemned all forms of Protestantism and their doctrines? Well, let's go to the source. Yes. This is the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, responses to some questions regarding certain aspects of the doctrine on the Church. First question. The source comes from Vatican.va. This is the official position of the Roman Catholic Church on its webpage. First question. Did the Second Vatican Council change the Catholic doctrine on the Church? Response. The Second Vatican Council neither changed nor intended to change the doctrine. That's pretty clear, isn't it, Martin? <laughs> Undoubtedly. Rather, it developed, deepened, and more fully explained it. This was exactly what John the Twenty-Third said at the beginning of the Council. This is the Second Vatican Council. Paul the Sixth affirmed it, because Pope John the Twenty-Third died while the Council was still in session, okay. and so Pope Paul the Sixth, the next Pope was also a Vatican II Pope. In fact, every Pope since John the Twenty Third has been a Vatican II Pope. Nothing has changed. Correct. Nothing. Paul the Sixth affirmed it and com commented in the act of promulgating the Constitution Lumen Gentium. So this is what Pope Paul the Sixth wrote, a very important document, which again relies largely on previous documents, right? Yes. So these things go back centuries. There's no better comment to make than to say that this promulgation really changes nothing of the traditional doctrine. What Christ willed, we also will. What was, still is. What the church has taught down through the centuries, we also teach. In simple terms, that which was assumed is now explicit. That which was uncertain is now clarified. That which was meditated upon, discussed and sometimes argued over is now put together in one clear formulation. Has Rome changed? Not at all. Instead, it cleared up misconceptions about the old one. So our... Uh, 
Roman Catholic conservative web pages that lament the fact that Vatican I seems to have been brushed aside mm. really don't understand what is going on here. Yeah. They don't understand the agenda. So we have to look at this very clearly. Let's go to Vatican II and see what we can glean. So the Jesuits, as in the First Vatican Council, were also the architects of the Second Vatican Council. And one of the most prominent priests, Roman Catholic Jesuit priests, of the Second Vatican Council was Karl Rana. And here we have a picture of another person sitting right next to him and there was already a change here. They didn't wear their official robes. Mm. They were dressed and in suits and ties. So two progressivist shirt and tie priests at Vatican II, Father Joseph Ratzinger, was a co-worker with Father Karl Rana at the council. So both of them were Vatican II individuals. As you know, Ratzinger, of course, became yes, Pope, Pope Benedict. Yeah. So he was also a Vatican II Pope. But he played the conservative drum. And now we have a Pope that is playing the liberal mm. drum. And this is a very clever move, because after Paul VI, then we had Pope John Paul I. Mm -hmm. He only lasted 33 days. Then came Pope John Paul II, a Vatican II Pope. And uh, the church was, was feeling the heat, right? And so we have a Pope in between who plays the uh, conservative drum a little more than the liberal drum. And then we move back to the agenda with Pope Francis. Now let's have a look what the motto was. Rano's motto was effectively, our Lord must conform to the world, not it to him. These are all Roman Catholic sources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not quoted from some obscure site. No. Rano's influence was enormous. He satisfied a modern world and modern churchmen whose ears were itching for doctrinal compromises under the pretext of enlightenment. That's an interesting quote. So let's read a little bit more about Karl Rahner. Karl Rahner is undoubtedly the most important Roman Catholic theologian in the 20th century. His seminal position amongst his contemporaries results to some extent from his ability to put theology and philosophy into dialogue. Now there we have a problem already. Philosophy and biblical truth are as far removed yeah. from each other as the East is from the West. So Greek philosophy cannot be mingled with biblical truth because mm -hmm. biblical truth is not the philosophy. No. It's a fact. Ex exactly. It's a word of God. And you cannot put them into dialogue because that is called syncretism. Exactly. So Karl Rahner originated a new religious category, anonymous Christianity. Now if your, your net is so wide mm -hmm. that you can incorporate any kind of fish, then why do you need a filter, right? You just absorb <laughs> everything, whether atheist yes. or occultist, or so-called Christian, or so-called any other world religion. Yeah. Doesn't matter, right? So they, they're actually all Christians, but they don't know it, based on the philosophy. Correct. Saying it embraced Buddhists, various other non-Christians, and even atheists, who are conscientious, upright, and caring. That's all it, all it takes. Mm -hmm. Just have to be a good person, and that's fine. Some kind of faith in God is basically there, whether they know it or not, said Rana. They are a part of a Christianity that does not call itself Christianity. Pagans who have received grace, but are not aware of it. Very interesting philosophy. So, 
you can actually leave them where they are. You don't have to evangelize them. Correct. Here's an article, an extract from a, a German magazine. And basically what it says is that this individual was the one who opened the door for the reunification of the Christian world. So that the Christians of the Protestant world and the Catholic world could unite. No. So this is the, the way in which this philosophy made it possible. Let's look at some of his quotes. But I think that the spirituality of Ignatius himself, which one learned through the practice of prayer and religious formation, was more significant to me than all the learned philosophy and theology inside and outside of the order. In other words, let's just get this quite straight. He's in harmony with our first lecture. Correct. The basis of your spirituality comes from the spiritual exercises and the formation you receive via those mm. in the Jesuit order. Yes. It's more important than the philosophy and more important than theology. theology. So forget about the Bible. Mm -hmm. Forget about everything else. That which you experience yes. is the norm. It's so dangerous. That is a very dangerous precept because it totally negates the biblical view of test the spirits. Correct. And it also becomes dangerous when you try and Christianize this. You cannot. If, even if you try and do this with the Bible, and instead, you know, there's a lot of danger in this, Correct. like we said in the first one. That's why you can have so many Christian mystics these days yes. doing their thing. So in his studies, Rana also became thoroughly conversant with the thinking of the fathers of the church, especially on the topics such as grace, the sacraments, spirituality, and mysticism. So these were actually mystics. Mm. They were no longer theologians. This is a mingling of mysticism, occult practices, yeah. and Christianity. So here is a web page called ignatianspirituality.com and it states the following. Karl Rana, Society of Jesus, Jesuit, one of the most important theologians of the 20th century, Karl Rahner, was born in March 1904. He was the fourth of seven children, the son of a local college professor and a devout Christian mother. In 1922, Karl followed his older brother Hugo and entered the Jesuit community. As a Jesuit novice, Rahner was formed in the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola, this formation had a lasting influence on his spiritual and intellectual development. So here we have it again from the Jesuit webpage directly. Correct. So the basis, as with Pope Francis, of the entire Vatican II movement was the spiritual exercises. Yes. Now Martin, if you can introduce the spiritual exercises in a modified form mm -hmm. into the Protestant churches. Yes. Then you will destroy them in terms of their basis on the Word of God. Right. From the inside. Yes. You don't even have to attack from outside. Correct. Then the Spirit becomes the norm and the Word becomes secondary. Correct. And then also, if the spiritual exercises were the base of Vatican II, then obviously because the Jesuits were in charge of the Council of Trent, Vatican I, that was the basis then as well. Correct. Now, there are stories about his private life, which we won't go into, but there's an article by John Venari, Carl Rano's girlfriend, and there are some interesting quotes in that. He says, The London Times wrote of Renza, Karl Rana's girlfriend at her death. She remained a practicing Roman Catholic to the end of her days, but campaigned for abortion and against celibacy, as well against, as against the power of the priesthood. 
In spite of that, she counted amongst her personal friends Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. She stood for the German presidency in 1984 at the age of 73 as a Green Party candidate and campaigned in the West for North Korean dictator King Tu Sung. Now, I put that in because it's very interesting that the philosophies that we read there are so prominent in the world today. Yeah. The abortion issue. Correct. The whole issue of bringing in socialism and the, the, the mode of thinking, uniting communism to the West through the glue which is socialism. Yes. So you have the Hegelian dialectic, right? Yeah. Thesis, antithesis, and then the synthesis. So this is where they were moving to. So they had to have room for these ultra-liberal ideas. Mm -hmm. So how do you bring them together? You have to create some form of compromise that incorporates them all. Mm. You mentioned now, you put this in because it's so relevant today. Yeah, well, there's, she was a Green Party candidate as Absolutely. well. You've got the whole climate in there as well. So everything started in the Vatican II era. Yeah. This whole green movement is not something that has happened now because suddenly there's climate change. This has been planned for a long time. Great. So Rana the Radical, Karl Rana himself, showed a similar maverick strain, remaining deeply rooted in his own version of Catholicism. He undermined perennial Catholic truth at every turn. Or so it seemed. Yes. Unlike the great father, Dennis Fahey, whose motto was, the world must conform to our Lord, not he to it, Rana's motto was effectively, our Lord must conform to the world, not it to him. Now, Martin, do we see that in the modern world? <laughs> yes, definitely. Right? I mean, a conservative Christian is appalled at what is happening in the world today. But it has gone so far that you dare not raise your voice even to a whimper no. because that would be hate speech. Yes, and it will go against the relative thought. Ah. Yeah. You think of it in one way, but that's your paradigm. Yes. I can think of it differently. There's no right or wrong answer. So this issue of tolerance can only be brought about when the crisis and the conflict has become so great that it is unbearable. Then you are willing to incorporate it for the sake of peace. You stay your gender, I'll stay my gender. If I want to change my gender, then you must say that is your personal decision and I will accept it and we can both do everything together if we develop this absolute tolerance question that was just an example yes. I wasn't choosing sides no I understand but uh, is it possible if you go back to the Bible that two systems diametrically opposed to each other one in harmony with what God says and one in disharmony with what God says can actually sit at the same table. Is it possible? I'm asking you. Yes. It's possible. Yes. Is it right? No. Because the Bible tells us you cannot be unequally yoked. Ah. So when you start walking with them and then you stand for a moment with them to listen to their point of view and eventually sit down at the same table, then your goose is cooked, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're in <a> trouble. <laughs> all right, how far will this go? Because you have to incorporate all. Mm -hmm. Now, this book, No Other Name, A Critical Survey of Christian att Attitudes Toward World Religions, was written by another Jesuit, Paul Netta. And Paul Netta was a student of Karl Rahner's. Okay. All right, so this is how it works. And here is the 
picture of him when he was younger and here is the picture of him when he was older. So Paul Netta served as a divine word missionary before assuming a position at Xavier University where he is presently professor of theology. He received his licentiate in theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University and he studied under Karl Rana. All right. Now, before earning a doctorate in theology from the Department of Protestant Theology at the University of Marburg, you have to now marry Protestantism and Catholicism, and then, once you've achieved that, you have to incorporate all other religions. So for the past 15 years, his main interest has been Christian dialogue with other religions, especially those of the East. His previous publications include Towards a Protestant Theology of Religions. Now the very name tells you what the content is going to be. Yeah. And uh, if you have studied it, you will see that he answers it perfectly. You can be whatever you like. You don't have to be saved in the name of Jesus Christ alone. Many, many paths. And then, of course, in his later time, he was very interested in Buddhism and other religions. And he wrote, Paul Netta, the Paul Tillich Professor of Theology, World Religion and Culture at Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York, is a leading theologian of religious pluralism and interreligious dialogue. Netta is author of more than a dozen books most recently. Without Buddha, I could not be a Christian. Netta's journey into interfaith dialogue began in 1964. So this is Vatican II. Correct. This is the theology that comes out of Vatican II. When he was a seminarian in Rome and experienced the Second Vatican Council firsthand at a time when the Roman Catholic Church declared its new attitude towards other religions. Uh, is the devil divided? No. But he appears so divided, yes. right? And it also brings to mind, this is directly opposing revelation that says, come out of her. Absolutely. This is saying, come no, into don't, her. just stay there and we'll just gather you where you are. We are dealing with a clash of minds here. Yes. There are two totally incompatible mindsets. Yes, and like you said, this is the mindset of Vatican II. Okay. Now, if you just think about Buddhism, mm. Buddhism is the exact antithesis to Christianity. It's the exact opposite. It's like yin-yang. Christ says he has come to fill us. Buddhism encourages you to empty yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's the exact opposite. The ultimate state that you can achieve in Buddhism is the state of nothingness. And that is the opposite of the Bible, the state of fullness. Yes. So it's amazing. And this spiritual exercises of Loyola is also about emptying and receiving then because whatever, yeah, whatever comes, comes into comes in. your mind, you must receive. We will see that in a moment. Very dangerous philosophy. So when John the twenty third died, Pope Paul the Sixth became the next Pope in the Vatican II scenario. And here is his encyclical, La Populorum Progressio. And this is the encyclical written by Pope Paul VI on the topic of the development of peoples. And that the economy of the world should serve mankind and not just the few. It was released on March 26, 1967. Martin, is that the same agenda as Pope Francis has? Yes. Exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So is he an ultra-modern pope, or is he just the same as the previous one? Same as the previous one. Nothing has changed. He also wrote in that encyclical, towards an effective world authority. 
Does Pope Francis ask for an effective world authority? Yes, a new world order. Correct. So he wrote here, Pope Paul VI wrote, such an international collaboration among the nations of the world certainly calls for institutions that will promote, coordinate and direct it until a new juridical order is firmly established and fully ratified. We give willing and wholehearted support to those public organizations that have already joined in promoting the development of nations and we ardently hope that they will enjoy ever-growing authority. As we told the United Nations General Assembly in New York, your vocation is to bring not just some people, but all people together as brothers. Does Pope Francis speak about fraternity? Yes, fraternity to TSL encyclical that he wrote about. Correct. Is it something new? Hmm? No. Who can fail to see the need and importance of thus gradually coming to the establishment of a world authority capable of taking effective action on juridical and political planes? Now, Martin, this was in 1967. Are we there? Yes. Yes. Correct. We are. So, thus... Pope Francis contradict any of the previous encyclicals? No. No, he's only enforcing them. Yes. So we need to understand Catholic social teaching because the world is so conflicted at the moment mm. and you have this massive divide between the rich and the poor which I believe is planned. Yes, and has been correct quite a time. And the, the sheer numbers of those that are feeling uh, oppressed yeah. is leading to the very chaos that we have in the world today. And those people that see the picture are to be intimidated into accepting this new mm -hmm. social order. So now let's have a look at Catholic social teaching. This comes from their web pages directly. So you need an authentic development. Authentic development involves a search for a humanism. Let's just stop there. Humanism basically excludes God altogether. Yes. Because humanism puts man at the center mm -hmm. and man decides what the direction of, of morality or whatever issue will be and not God. Yeah. So to humanism totally excludes God. So search for a humanism which will enable everyone to find themselves anew by embracing the higher values of love and friendship, of prayer and contemplation. Do you hear anything about the word? No. Authentic development is for each and all the transition from less human conditions to those which are more human. Yeah, and who determines the more human? Humans. The humans. Yeah. And which humans in particular? The Pope. Martin, this is, excuse me, so ridiculous that one can only shake the head. So what they're talking about, less human and more human, is the way in which you live. Mm -hmm. And that's why salvation is defined as living a human life. Salvation is not something that you find in Christ. It is something that you find by coming out of the social quagmire that you are in into a better state. Let's give you a universal income. Correct. Then you won't be poor. Mm. And those that are so super rich that have lived in luxury all their lives need to come down a mm -hmm. couple of notches so we can all be one. Equally poor. Correct. So this comes out of Pope Paul VI, uh, Popularum Progressio, and it's exactly the same tune. Yes. Played on the same musical instrument that Pope Francis is using. The nature of authentic development is such that all the nations of the world must participate. Mm. 
for example, through fair trade relationships and international cooperation, or it will not be true development. So if some nations are more prosperous than others, by the nature of their economy and their work ethic, then they will have to come down a notch in order to make the others come up a notch. Yes. And of course, common good. This also comes from Mata e Magistra, mother and teacher of the church. The common good is the complete development of all people of the world. John the 23rd describes it as the sum total of conditions of social living whereby persons are enabled more fully and readily to achieve their own perfection. Now, if you read that, is that biblical? No. <laughs> it's as far removed from the Bible as the East is from the West, right? Yeah. Christian perfection is found in Christ. Correct. Here you find it in, in your social environment. Yeah. So the common good also provides a balance against too strong an individualism. Isn't that interesting? Yes, 1965 it was written this and Pope Francis is saying exactly the same. So is he a modern Pope bringing in change or is he just applying that which is already decided? Yes, Okay. 100%. So individualism will have to go. By emphasizing the social aspect of the human person. If your individualism allows you to rise above others, then it will have to go. It's a virus. Yeah. It's interesting if you remember the first one, Jesuits have to, uh, are given a period where they are demoted. Correct. And that's to get this. So that they have this mindset. Yes. Authentic development is possible only if an individual interacts with and grows within society. In other words, he may not exceed what society is about. Thus, each of us is required to work for the common good, which includes all others within society. Even property of its nature also has a social aspect, which is based on the law of the common purpose of goods. Therefore, Martin, you possess no. nothing. Did the World Economic Forum say that? I want, definitely, and that's their agenda. So is their agenda that some people are appalled at and are willing to go onto the barricades, is that a new agenda thought up by Klaus Schwab? No. Or is it an old agenda? Old. Okay. Distributism. Interesting word, right? Distributism is based on the notion that power follows property. Combined with a genuine love of freedom and a desire to spread the benefits of freedom and economic initiatives as widely as possible. Seen from the point of view of Catholic social teaching, it is a real response to John Paul's call for a change of lifestyle of models of production and consumption and of the established structures of power which today govern societies. Is this the same tune that Francis is singing? Yes, 100%. 100%, right? Economic justice. Economics should be governed by justice, not simply by the laws of the marketplace. Increasingly, the laissez-faire attitude of market-centered economics is being challenged by the idea that there is intrinsic to all human activities an element of responsibility to the wider community. So you, you're not an island. No. Now, it's interesting, Martin, that that is also a Christian principle. Mm. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. yes. But this benevolence that springs out of a relationship with God, that you care for others, is something that is instilled by God into you. Correct. In this system, it is something that is instilled to you by law. Correct. Therefore, it is coercion. Yes. It doesn't come from self. It doesn't come from the right source. Mm. It comes from a different source. The earliest and most striking argument for economic justice in the modern times came from the encyclical Rerum Novarum, 
We're always going back to that. Yeah. Where Leo the 13th argued that wages were not to be decided by what employers or employers could get away with under the working of the market. Instead of a merely economic wage, a worker had a right to be paid a just wage. This would be negotiated by free collective bargaining, but should allow a worker to live in reasonable comfort. John the 23rd developed these ideas further in Mater e Magistra, Mother and Teacher, saying that the church is called in truth, justice and love to cooperate in building with all men and women an authentic communion. In this way, economic growth will not be limited to satisfying men's needs, but it will also promote their dignity. So there is this move that consumerism needs to be curtailed. Yes. Do we see that in the web pages today and in the newspaper? Yes, there's a big movement and there's a call by the European Sunday Alliance to get this in the European Union implemented. Now, you know, the world is living in excess. Yeah. That is a fact. Yeah. And maybe they allowed the excess mm -hmm. in order to create the problem. I found it interesting that the German government at one stage was speaking now during the lockdowns and saying, we don't need all of these cheeses. Yes. You need mm. one or two and that's it. Mm. Be satisfied with what you have. Yes. We, We're living too luxuriously. Yeah, when the lockdown, um, lockdowns came, they decided what is a necessity. Correct. But, Martin, if you follow the Bible then you will develop lifestyles that have temperance built into them. Yes. And then it comes from a source which is not directed by the marketplace. And this question of wage, this issue of equality, is that an issue in the world today? Sure. Hectic. And then there's a social agenda. In his preface to the social agenda, Cardinal Van Tuan, who was president of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace when it was published in 2000, made this statement about the value of Catholic social teaching. The social teaching of that remarkable series of popes since Leo XIII. Now that was the Pope of Rerum Novarum. Mm -hmm. So that's where it started, right? can be for the Christian of our time a great source of orientation and a general instrument of evangelization. We all need this teaching. Martin, do you need the teaching that you have the right to take from others without asking them? No. Do you need a teaching where you have the right to take from others to supply the needs of third parties without asking them. Yeah. In other words, if a thief enters your home mm -hmm. and you happen to have three televisions in your home, he can take two. Mm -hmm. One for himself and one for his friend who also doesn't have one. Yeah. And that is his right. It's not stealing because you are living in excess and they are living in poverty, right? right. Now, yeah. is that biblical? No, and it was also romanticized by Robin Hood. Correct. Now, I'm always interested in this Robin Hood scenario because uh, that basically went against uh, Protestant mm. and Protestant world, right? And uh, it's interesting that his name was Hood, which in English means <laughs> that he's uh, an infidel. Okay. Yes, he, and uh, some made a little joke and called him Robin Hood. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah. So the demands of justice and peace have an application to all levels of human life, whether individual, global, or in the context of the society in which we live. Pius XI strongly linked this theme of Catholic social teaching with the common good and the dignity of the human person, recognizing that the provisions of the necessary means for each member of society to flourish 
is the best way to ensure development of that society as a whole. Martin, have you heard one iota of redemptive theology? No. No, this is all humanism. Humanism. So the only redemption which Catholicism offers humanity is a social structure. Yes. Now, Martin, that is building your kingdom on this world. Correct. On this earth. But the Lord Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. It is as far removed from this world as the east is from the west. And it spills over into Protestantism as well. Exactly. Be because so many people are looking for a worldly savior and a kingdom that will be built on earth. And can you believe it, Martin, that there are churches that come together to discuss these issues, social mm -hmm. doctrines, ecological issues, sustainable development, climate issues, which are devoid of any spirituality. Yes. Now, you said they spill over into the Protestant world, right? Mm. Well, Robert Schuller said the church's problem is that it had a God-centered theology for centuries when it needs a man-centered one. Is this philosophy in the Protestant world? 100%. And this man... It's a big name. Is a very big man. Who was his mentor? Do you know? Um, Let me help you. It was Norman Vincent Peale. Peel. Okay. Norman Vincent Peale, 33 degree Freemason. Yes. And he, I was in the Masonic Lodge and I took his picture signed by him as a 33 degree Freemason. <laughs> right? Uh, is there a modern president that also had Norman Vincent Peale as his mentor? Yes. Donald that was? Trump. Donald Trump. You see how it all links together? Yes. I find this very interesting. Now my question is, where did he get this idea from? And of course, it comes from Vatican II. At the conclusion of Vatican II, Pope Paul VI told the bishops that their church had decided to opt for man, to serve man, to help him build his home on this earth. Man with his ideas and his aims, man with his hopes and his fears, man in his difficulties and sufferings, that was the centerpiece of the church's interest, said the pontiff to the bishops. This comes from Malachi Martin, Keys of this Blood. Now, my question is, with this kind of philosophy, can you unite all of humanity? Yes. Yes, you can. But you have to rob the mm -hmm. true Christian of Christ. Yes. And you have to convince him that his kingdom is on earth. Correct. Now, that is Catholicism at its best because Catholicism teaches a millennialism. Mm. In other words, there's not going to be a millennium. The church is going to rule. And when these social issues are implemented in the world, then the church will indeed rule. Yes. But it will be the kingdom of darkness. Correct. Richard McBrien wrote, The mission of the church is one of service to the people, especially the poor, the oppressed, and the marginalized. Although structures of authority are necessary for this mission, those structures are always subordinate to it and are to be judged by their capacity to enable the church to fulfill the mission. In other words, what he's saying is that it is man-centered in its totality. Mm. Everything has to be subservient to that idea. And this is where we are in the world today. From the feminist comes the view that the church as an exodus community called to abandon the established social order and its religious agents of sacralitizing and to witness an alternative social order. That's the agenda. A new social order. Yes. And we see this in all the 
articles that we've shown and and we've arrived at that point yeah. in history so this is nothing to do with the changed roman catholic church it has nothing to do with the changed doctrine and it is now time to implement it so what does this tell you if the time has come to implement it then surely they have changed the mindset of protestantism enough to be able to deal with the few dissenters that will exactly. remain. The Pope, we had an article a while back, said that the common good has become global. Has become global. So they, they're so ready Martin, for it. Who is going to array himself against this philosophy? Only those that are Bible-based. Correct. So is there a clash of minds coming? Oh, definitely. Absolutely. Like you just said. So many have already joined this that those that are going to stand will be in the minority. Correct. And then you just deal with them like a cancer. Yes. The cancer of individual, this virus, will have to inoculate against it. Correct. We'll have to remove it. That's what Thomas Aquinas said. Yes, and that was b from before the Dark Ages already. Correct. Absolutely. So, Let's have a look at Vatican II and the Gospel Proclamation because there's no room for the Gospel, right? Mm. So, Father McBrien labels the above ideas as belonging to the change agent or servant model of the Church, which stresses proclamation and praxis of the Gospel by application of the Gospel to the struggle for social justice, peace and human rights. There's the gospel of the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. There's the gospel of the entire world. It's not about salvation in Christ. It's about the struggle for social justice. On all levels, whether it be racial or whatever, in Christ you will be one no matter what social strata you come from, no matter what background you come from, what race you come from, mm -hmm. you will be one in Christ. It's a different unity. And it's a unity based on individual choice. He writes, The Church's activities on behalf of social justice or human rights are not merely preparatory to the real mission of the Church as the notion of pre evangelization had it before Vatican II, the Church's commitment to and involvement in the struggle for social justice, peace and human rights is an essential or constitutive part of its mission. That is the mission. The Gospel is gone. Yeah. So now Martin, my next question then is how did you how did they manage to infiltrate this into Protestantism. You had to take away the word-based theology. The theology had to move in the direction of Ignatian spirituality. And Ignatian spirituality is based on experience and feeling. Yeah. So the whole mode of worship mm -hmm had to change. Yes. Now, how did they do that? Well, Vatican II and the Charismatic Movement. Jo Cardinal Joseph Sunens, Templeton Prize recipient in 1976, was also a Freemason, being initiated on June the 15th, 1967. And this is how you reach Protestants, right? Mm. Because supposedly Freemasonry is a Protestant yes. movement, but in actual fact, it's run by the Jesuit order. Chosen by Pope John XXIII to be one of the chief architects of the Vatican II meetings, he served on all four of its major committees. And he stated, Since I've had this charismatic experience, my allegiance to the Holy Father as the vicar of Christ in the world has been heightened and strengthened. My appreciation for Mary as the co-redemptress and mediatoress of my salvation has been assured. 
my appreciation of the Mass as the sacrifice of Christ has now been heightened. Let's take those points, Martin. Is that Christianity? No. It's totally opposite. It's totally the opposite. Mm -hmm. So, Mariology, do you find that anywhere in the Bible? No. No, because Mary is asleep, right? She knows nothing. She will be resurrected with the saints on the last day. Uh, his devotion to the Pope has been heightened. God in the Old Testament lamented the fact that the Israelites wanted a king because they rejected him as king. And it's interesting if you look at even the Protestant wars in England, where England enforced its form of government and Protestantism on the Scots, for example. Mm. The Scots said, we have no king but Jesus. Yeah. And uh, I stand with the Scots on that issue. So is Mary co-redemptress and mediatoris of salvation? No, only Jesus. So can the charismatic experience lead you to a false religion? Yes. Definitely. Right? So Vatican II said this about the charism. It is not only through the sacraments and church ministries that the Holy Spirit sanctifies and leads the people of God. He distributes special graces amongst the faithful of every rank. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone for profit. These charismatic gifts, whether they be the most outstanding or the more simple and widely diffused, are to be received with thanksgiving and consolation, for they are exceedingly suitable and useful for the needs of the church. Hmm. So, Martin, when they say that you must receive the Spirit with thanksgiving, is that biblical? No. Why not? Because you must test the spirits. Ah, because you don't know whether the Spirit is from God or from another source. Correct. Because if it leads you to believe that Mary is your Redeemer or co-Redeemer, <laughs> you have a problem, yes, right? Yes, exactly. So yeah, you must go back to the standard. And what if the Spirit tells you you don't have to keep the commandments of God? Yeah, then that's, if, according to this, that's what you do. All right. So once the Spirit becomes the norm mm -hmm. and you accept it as the norm, that means you can accept even false doctrines? Yes. Okay. So let's look at Pope John Paul II and the charismatic renewal. So while meeting with a number of people in 1998 already, he said, Open yourselves docilely to the gifts of the Spirit. Accept gratefully and obediently the charism which the Spirit never ceases to bestow on us. Just accept it. Is that biblical, Mark? No. Because you have to test it. Aha. Uh -huh. Right. Let's see what he said further. He said in 1998, this comes from CatholicJHB.org. He said, Come, Holy Spirit, come and renew the face of the earth. Come with your seven gifts. Come, Spirit of life, Spirit of communion and love. The church and the world need you. Come, Holy Spirit, and make ever more fruitful the charism you have bestowed on us. Give new strength and missionary zeal to these sons and daughters of yours who have gathered here. Open their hearts, renew their Christian commitment to the world. Make them courageous messengers of the gospel, witnesses to the risen Jesus Christ, the Redeemer and Savior of man. Strengthen their love and their fidelity to the church. Mm. Sounds pretty good, right? Yeah. John Paul II has stated boldly that the movements are the hope of the church. Ratzinger has noted a similar significance and has called the times we are living in a Pentecostal hour. Mm. So this is a movement that comes from Vatican II. So let's look at an article in Zenit, which is a Roman Catholic source. And it states the following. The Holy Spirit, considered until a few years ago as the unknown God, is the one who with his grace tirelessly changes the lives of thousands of people in all corners of the world. 
who with renewed joy through the experience of baptism in the Spirit begin a new life live precisely in the Holy Spirit. So Pesare told Zenit. So everything must now revolve around the manifestations of the Spirit. Yes. And he's the unknown God. Mm -hmm. I thought he's the one that testifies about Jesus. But now Jesus is pushed aside and the Holy Spirit is the one that takes the prominent position with no reference to the Word of God. Correct. And all of this goes back to the spiritual exercises. Correct. Because your spiritual exercises has to do with your feelings, your smell, the listening and all these feelings that you have. This is nothing other than a modified form of the spiritual exercises of Loyola. Because whatever the Spirit implanted in him, that's what he accepted. Yes. But where does that Spirit come from? Now, listen to this, Martin. This is fascinating. He is the one we wish to honor and glorify publicly, responding to the appeal that both John Paul II as well as Benedict XVI made to CCR and the whole church to spread the culture of Pentecost and the actions of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church and in each of the faithful. Now, Martin, is that biblical that we should honor and glorify the Holy Spirit publicly? Or did the Bible tell us that he came to glorify Christ? Correct. Christ is the one who is glorified. When he comes, he will testify of me, mm -hmm. said Jesus. Mm -hmm. He will not speak of his own. He will lead you to the plan of salvation. This is a new religion, Martin. Mm -hmm. And it comes out of the Second Vatican Council. Correct. It is totally new. So this celebration, which will include moments of prayer, listening, witness and invocation of the Spirit, will end with a celebration of prayer, a music concert and dance, which will be presented as prayer by artists of different countries. Martin, when you look at that, that is Loyola's exercises to the T. Mm -hmm. Because you are first praying, listening, witness, the invocation of the Spirit, and then you end again yeah. with a prayer. And normally those prayers are repetitive prayers. Mm, mm. And the Bible warns against that. So Martin, as you saw, they linked it there, this contemplative activity, to music. Mm, mm. So music plays a very important role. So let's just go to the Vatican II documents. This is Vatican II documents, page 83. So in the section on music, in the liturgy we read, in order that the faithful may actively participate more willingly and with greater benefit, it is fitting that the format of the celebration and the degree of participation in it should be varied as much as possible, depending on the nature of the congregation present. So if you have a young uh, jivey congregation, let it go, right? Let it rip. If they're more conservative, be a little bit careful. But music is the way in which we will change the world. Correct. It comes from Vatican II. Prior to Vatican II, Christian churches were places where you had Bible reading, where you had sermons, where you had hymns of praise, and a close. Basically, that was what happened in the Protestant mm. churches. This kind of activity came after Vatican II. Then the liturgy. Now what is the liturgy, Martin? The liturgy is everything that happens in a church service mm. that has nothing to do with preaching. Correct. The steps. The and steps, no, the correct. So in Roman Catholicism, the liturgy takes first place. The procedure, yes. not the word. In Protestantism, the word takes first place. So in this way, you create a show. Correct. 
It's a stage show. Mm -hmm. This is Jesuit theater at its best. It is entertainment. Correct. And it's directed at your senses. At your senses. All five of them, right. as Loyola stated. So it is a sign under which the scattered children of God may be gathered together until there is one fold and one shepherd. Now, Martin, that means that the papacy will be totally in control. So you need a musical celebration and you need a most effective style of celebration is when music is involved. So more recent heritage of sacred music, you must introduce popular religious songs, playing of the organ or of other instrument characteristic of a particular people. It's very gently that they brought this in. Didn't Rick Warren also say that your church has to accommodate the community where it is? Exactly. So many of the charismatic churches that developed after Vatican II are based on the music, music culture of, of the area. Mm. So some of them are country and western based, some of them are pop culture, some of them are hard rock, yes. etc. Some are heavy metal. Yes. So the participation of the celebration should be internal, but must be external also. That is as to show the internal participation by gestures, bodily attitudes, acclamations, responses, and singing. So everything had to become more lively. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in Article 1157, they say, Song and music fulfill their function as signs in a manner all the more significant when they are more closely connected with the liturgical action. So not with the sermons, right? Yeah. This is an experience. This is a show. According to three principal criteria, beauty expressive of prayer, the unanimous participation of the assembly at the designated moments and the solemn character of the celebration. In this way, they participate in the purpose of the liturgical words and actions, the glory of God and sanctification of the faithful. And then notice how they bring in the emotion. How I wept, deeply moved by your hymns, songs and voices that echoed through the church. What emotion I experienced in them. This is the catechism. So we shift from a mind-orientated religion together with emotion to an emotion-driven Yes, religion. yes, that's important, what you've just said. It's not to exclude this, no, but the, it's been turned on its head. He's the master of reversal. Mm. Let us look how far this has gone. Uh, if we look at a modern rave concert, is it possible to bring that same structure into the church? I'm sure it is. Uh, you've been in that world. <laughs> yes, you? and I've been involved in both of the, these uh, a worldly rave and a Christian festival. Now, Martin, weren't you a DJ? Yes. You were a DJ? Mm -hmm. You played this kind of stuff? Yes. And what did it do to you? Well, it's emotionally high. It kicks you in an emotionally high state. And at the, the raves, you enhance that feeling mm -hmm. by partaking in drugs, right? Yes, and eventually... You don't even have to take any substances because your body has become so accustomed to this music. So that the music by itself will create yes, the same Yes, your sensation. serotonin releases from itself, your um, energy levels kick in, and you're on, you can go on for hours without even taking anything. That's how you get used to it. Now, Martin, if you come from that religious system, and you obviously do, don't you find the one that you are in now boring in comparison? Well, at the beginning, it was <laughs> a nightmare. Yeah, how I did said you feel? the first thing that I would want to change the music. You wanted to change the music. Yes. And as you spiritually, spiritually grow, then you start realizing, wow, no, this you don't want to have any of this other music infiltrating. Uh, who so you, you, are. you want to tell me that you did a 180 degree turn? No, definitely. 
180 degrees, yes. exact opposite of what you were before. Yes. And it took quite some adjusting. Oh, it's hard. It's not, it's, it's, music is like a drug. It's like a drug. Mm. Well, let's have a look at this rave concert. I hope it's not too long, right? I don't want to be <laughs> 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 turbocharged here. Let's have a look. So, Martin, we saw what happened in that, and it's interesting, we're not going to do a music video now, but those rhythms are basically ancient voodoo rhythms. Mm -hmm. And they create a condition so that a Lao, a lesser god, can take possession of you. That's basically spirit possession. Correct. And to put it succinctly, it's demon possession. There's an excellent series called Distraction Dilemma. That series really helped me to make my final decision on, on music. And it was done by Christian Bardell. I'm I watched that series as well. And it, it is really a must for everybody that listens to music, even radio music. I will put a link to excellent. that little series in as well. So now we'll take that rave culture and we'll transport it into the Christian world and we'll look at well this is a video by Hillsong so this is Christian basically rave let's look at it so my question to you is has Vatican II been successful Definitely. Is uh, Pope Francis out of line or is he doing his job? He's doing his job. He's implementing exactly what they've been planning for years. All right. Let's just make sure before we wrap this up. Here is the spokesman review. And it's dealing with the time in 1997 when John Paul was uh, active and it says, tonight Pope John Paul II will give his blessing to rock and roll. The Pope and a retinue of cardinals and bishops will attend a church-sponsored concert that will feature American folk rock icon Bob Dylan. The occasion is the 23rd World Eucharistic Con Congress being held in northern Italian city of Bologna. The church is evidently hoping that it can use rock and roll as a medium to reach a larger audience of young people. This plan of reaching a larger audience of young people is implemented in all churches. They don't want to lose the youth, so they're thinking of all these worldly ways of keeping them in the church. Every denomination on the planet it is a very sad state of affairs. But let's continue. The Pope's idea is to get closer to young people through pop music, which unfortunately for many years has been viewed with suspicion and indifference by the church, said Monsignor Domenico Sigalinini, a spokesman for the Eucharistic Congress. See how unfortunate it is that we didn't use this medium in the past. We don't have to read it all. But this is what it's all about. Now let's look at this. Nudging his 80s, Pope goes pop with an ABBA CD. So he's showing the trend. And the young people loved, loved it. it. I remember in one of your lectures in Total Onslaught, yes. there was a video that you showed where Pope uh, Paul, John Paul II arrived at a rock concert. Well, it was basically like a rock concert. Oh. It was a meeting to honor him. Oh. And they were singing all kinds of music. And there was loud music and, uh, uh, you know, rock bands were playing. And they still said, how do you feel about this? They asked this one priest, how do you feel about all this loud music? And they said, this is wonderful. This is what we need, etc., etc." So now let's jump to Pope Francis. Wake up. Here's an article. 
from 2015 as Pope Francis debuts a rock song. Really? We explore 500 years of papal tunes. The rift began in the 1960s when the Second Vatican Council convened, penning a series of sweeping documents that precipitated a sea change in Roman Catholic doctrine. Many of the reforms were initiated with an eye towards making the church more accessible and modern. Consequently, Catholic liturgical music began to show the influence of pop and folk rock. To some it rang the death knell for traditional and contemporary classical music in the church and it led to the rise of the pop-minded pop album. Or is it the pop-minded pop album? Wake Up follows in the synth and string-laden tradition of Pope John Paul II's 1999 devotional album Abba Pater and in 2009 recording by Pope Benedict XVI's Alma Mater Music from the Vatican. Martin, this is an agenda well planned, well executed. executed. Definitely. Do you agree? They've oh. been very successful. And they've used music to destroy the heart of Christianity. Yes. And it stemmed from the spiritual exercises of Loyola. It is spiritual exercises at its best because you're creating the atmosphere mm. for this spirit engagement. Do you know, Martin, if you go into a casino, mm. there's a certain drone music that is playing in the background. Mm. It is to switch off your mind so that you will not be able to control your actions through your cognitive yeah. thinking. They are the masters of this because they, like you said, it comes from Jesuit theater as well. They actually use all of that also to switch off the mind. So let's just go to the spirit of prophecy. There's something peculiarly sacred in the human voice. Its harmony and its subdued and heaven-inspired pathos exceeds every musical instrument. Vocal music is one of God's gift to men, an instrument that cannot be surpassed or equaled when God's love abounds in the soul. Singing with the Spirit and the understanding also is a great addition to devotional services in the house of God. How this gift has been debated based. And Martin, this was written in the 1800s. When sanctified and refined, it would accomplish great good in breaking down the barriers of prejudice and hot-hearted unbelief, and would be the means of converting souls. It is not enough to understand the rudiments of singing, but with the understanding, with the knowledge must be such a connection with heaven that angels can sing through us. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Now at that rave concert, Christian rave concert, the Bible must be as far removed from your mind as the East is from the West. You see, that's the problem. You think, you, while, you ex while you're experiencing this wonderful feeling with goosebumps all over, this is the way it should be. It's so dangerous. I'm glad that uh, you've come out of that experience. Let's just look at a few verses here and we'll wrap it up. Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God and with, with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the basic summary of love to God, right? And your heart is involved. Your soul, that is your whole being, the whole person mm -hmm. is involved and your mind must be yes. involved. If you separate any of these elements, you're in trouble. That's how you worship God. Correct. Let's just make sure. Psalms 47 verses 6 and 8. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto you, our King. Sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. 
God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. You cannot divorce the emotion from the cognitive. They have to be together. Let's just make sure. And they have to be in harmony with the Bible. They have to be in harmony. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. Not whatever I shall receive. No, I must pray with the understanding, and I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. God is not against emotion. No. He didn't create you with the capacity not to cry. No. He created you with the capacity to cry, to be sad, to be happy, to be joyful, to have all of those experiences. Mm -hmm. But once those experiences override your understanding and your mind, mm -hmm. then you are in trouble. Yes, that's the important thing. Once it's been turned on its head, Correct. You have to realize if you, and it's easy. If you compare it to what you read in the Bible, you will realize it is not in harmony. And there are so many examples. How many people say when they are on the verge of or actually going into adultery, hmm. say, this feeling that I have is so good it must be from God. <laughs> yeah, that's hey? exactly how it is. That's how it is, right? Yeah. This feeling is so good, it must be from God. And then you commit adultery and you break the law of God. Was it from God or was it from the devil? No, definitely from the devil. So with that in mind, let us just contemplate what Vatican II was all about, what the papal agenda is, what Pope Francis is actually doing, and how the whole world is being swept into this net. And may God preserve his people from being trapped in that net. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this world is a very dangerous place. And we have a very, very sly, evil spirit that controls the minds of men. Help us, Lord, to be steeped in your word and to accept no spirit but that which is in harmony with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe to our channel, click here. To get notifications, click on the bell. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you, and we'll see you again.